All right, welcome back everyone to the final Nortel lecture. Leola will speak on the wave turbulence theory for a stochastic KDD type of question. Thank you. So thank you for coming for the last one. And uh, this is um, um, different than what I talked about yesterday, but somehow related. So in fact, a couple of slides in within the talks at the beginning will connect to yesterday's lecture. Um, oh, by the way, you can see here, most of this work is with my collaborator, Bin Chan from Texas a &M. Okay, so um, wait, what is wave turbulence theory? And here I basically reported what we have in uh, the web page of our um, final collaboration grant on web. And uh, what it says is when uh, you have a system uh, with a lot of waves interacting, clearly you're not interested in understanding what is the behavior of each single little wave, but what you want to see is uh, the global contribution of them. So it's more of a statistical study of these waves. So when a number of waves are present, the description of each individual wave is neither possible nor relevant. What becomes of physical importance are practical use, uh, the density, the statistics, and the interaction of the wave. And this is what we define web turbulence theory. Um, now, you, well, the study of wave turbulence, it's very vast. And uh, there is one particular equation that uh, seems to be of importance uh, when observing phenomena that are at different kind of scales. And just to give you an idea, I put here black holes and internal waves. This, you know, we also you see the surface of the, of the oceans, for example, both Einstein concentrate, which is very small. Um, and somehow this equation, which you will see in a few slides, um, it's used in many of uh, the studies of these different scales, in particular in climates, study of climates. And so um, I, up to this moment, um, well, up in the last few years, the equation has been derived in a formal way. And in fact, I will tell you how that's done uh, for one particular dispersive equation. But the rigorous derivation, so really the mathematical derivation of it, um, it's, uh, it's not that simple. And I will try to, um, with pictures, I will try to explain why it's not simple. Okay. So let's start with the same equation that we have seen from the first lectures. So it's uh, the Schrodinger equation. And if you remember in the lectures up to yesterday, this uh, number here was uh, either plus or minus one. In fact, I will always take plus one, the default in case. So now today it's a parameter epsilon, which is gonna tend to zero. That's because we are interested in weakly nonlinear um, systems of dispersive equation. Where is the variable X? The physical variable is gonna be in a box of size L with the periodic boundary conditions. So these parameters, epsilon and L, is gonna appear uh, throughout the talk. And then I realized when I was looking at the talk that later on this L would become capital D, but you know, uh, indulge me on that. I just didn't realize that before. So what one would, what one would to study, given an initial data, is what happens to the Fourier coefficient. That's um, a way of uh, what people uh, used to say, uh, as they say, when you study this, you study the energy spectrum of your system. More than that, since this is going to be, as I mentioned in the very general description of wave turbulence, more than that, it's going to be a probability underlining. But just think about, for example, uh, taking initial data, which are just random data. I will be a little bit more specific in a, in a moment, but there is a probability um, in the background. That's why what you're really looking at is the expectation of the Fourier coefficient, size of the Fourier coefficient square. And there is an important parameter that we're going to see in a moment, which is the time epsilon to the minus two. That's called the kinetic time. What you wanted to learn is what happens as you take first L to infinity and then epsilon to zero. At least this is the way, the order in which the physicists uh, have been um, deriving in a formal way what I will show you in a second, the wave kinetic equation. So take the limit as L equal to infinity, so the box becomes large, or epsilon equal to zero, 
of this quantity. And that gives you an object, which will depend on this tau, and an equation for this object n. Okay, and this is the wave kinetic equation. This Q is called the collision operator. And uh, um, I think at the very first lecture that I gave, I call this QK and I give a specific, um, the, the definition for that. And you will see now what happens also in a little bit. Now to connect to what I was saying yesterday, also yesterday, I was studying uh, the behavior of the Fourier coefficient but there was no probability involved. In fact, it was a completely, totally deterministic way of doing things. And in fact, what, we, what I was trying to understand was the motion from low K, low frequency K to high frequency K. So this was the content of yes lectures. And in particular, if you remember, the way we studied that, which comes from Bruggen, is we take the object of study, we multiply by the um, k, the weight k, then we sum, and that actually gives us the HS norm, and we look at the limit. I put here just t goes to infinity, but for this equation, it's the reversible, so also t goes to minus infinity. And I just gave some names here. So this was yesterday to compare. So there was no probability. Today, there is a probability. And uh, the derivation of that equation that I wrote before, the wave kinetic equation, um, was done originally in a formal way, and I will show in a moment. But the um, uh, first um, signs of these equations um, came already in the work of Pels, then Hesselman, and then um, uh, many of my people. In particular, today, what I will do for you is the derivation that Nazarenko does formally, so that you get to see how you come up with that equation. Um, so what, what, what is it done in this, uh, in this works, in particular the one on Nazarenko? You start from your dispersive equation, whether it's an LS or KDV, um, or modified KDV or KDV in higher dimension, whatever, you start with that. And you have these two parameters, the epsilon in front of the nonlinearity, the L as the size of the box. And then um, you start um, deciding things such as, I'm gonna not consider anything which is, big, which is smaller than epsilon square. And uh, I'm gonna just uh, look at few terms instead of all the terms that comes in, a, for example, in the um, Duhamel expansion. And then you start taking limits, but everything is formal. And then it pops up to you that the wave kinetic equation, which remarkably, although lots of terms have been ignored, lots of things have done in a formal way, happen to be very effective when you actually use in a computational situation. Okay, so um, let me make it this, what I said, a little bit more mathematical. And let me start with uh, a different equation than what you have seen before. This is the zakharov cuts method and is uh, just a higher dimension KDV uh, equation. So there is, again, the derivative in time. Then there is, this is a third order operator. So you are taking derivative with respect to the first coordinate, and then you take the Laplace in all the coordinates. So this is order three. And if you are in one dimension, clearly just, this is just derivative order three. Then there is the epsilon in front of our nonlinearity. And this is the typical nonlinearity of the KDV where the other derivative is only taken with respect to the first coordinate. Okay? We are in a box of size L, we have periodic conditions. And again, this is the object that we want to study, the um, expectation of the Fourier coefficient. And there is, uh, I mentioned already this particular time. So the tau is just a constant that for us is small. But the important thing is how you measure the, tau, the time with respect to the small parameter in front of, of the nonlinearity. And this is the time you want to cover in your expansion. And you end up having something like this. I will show how you get to that. And then here you take the limit as L goes to infinity and epsilon goes to zero, and you come up with that by having this probability. Now, what is this Q? I want to write it for you for this particular equation. In particular, this Q is going to be, it's going to have a, a quadratic form because we have here the quadratic linearity. If you have a Schrodinger equation, then you will see three functions. Okay, so the Q, the collision operator, has the following form. So here is the announced, so you, this is a function. You have 
two of them here, which corresponds to the quadratic nonlinearity. Then this delta just tells you that you are in a, um, like you know, the, the outcome of the wave is on uh, frequency K1. So then the waves K2 and K3 are linked to K1, such as K1 is equal to K2 plus plus K3. This delta here is also delta function. And now the omega is the uh, dispersive um, equation, the, the, the dispersive function, the omega K, which in our case is what? Well, if you remember, I have a Laplacian. So that's the K square when you take Fourier transfer. And then you have a derivative with respect to the first corner. So that brings down the first component of your frequency, which is just one. So this one here stands for the coefficient, but sorry, the coordinate. This two here, because we are just looking at the absolute value, stands as a square. So I hope it's not too confusing. Just so that uh, um, you um, compare with NLS, the NLS is just k square because we just have the Laplace there no more. Okay, so this is the way the equation looks. And I can announce already, although um, this one is the equation that people use as you, the wave kinetic equation associated with this dispersed equation, but mathematically, you have to do something about this delta function because this omega is not regular enough to define uh, a good measure. Anyway, we're gonna get to that in a second. And as I announced already, since you start with a quadratic nonlinearity, this uh, collision operator is also <coughs> quadratic type. In fact, this is called three wave kinetic equation. Three because you have an outgoing one and the, the two are coming. The one for the show would call four waves. Okay, so uh, here is the formal derivation that you can find if you read the book on Azarenko. We start with that equation. Uh, the one that I gave you here. Oh, sorry, let me go back to this. This, we start with this, and then we're going to normalize the, so the solution phi because we want to get rid of this derivative here. So, what we do is, I just realized that I call it phi and now I'm calling it c. But anyway, this is the solution of your dispersed equation. I'm using a different notation, but it's phi. So, and we're going to normalize because we want to get rid of the derivatives in the non, in the non linearity. And now we define this Fourier coefficient a k t. Now, what kind of probability? So here we go a little bit more in depth. What kind of probability are assuming you here? Well, Nazarenko assumes that uh, uh, this a k is a random phase amplitude field. What that means is that if you think of a k in a um, polar coordinates of like the magnitude and the phase, then the magnitude and the phase they just a um, random variable independent. And that's what you <coughs> really use in the derivation. Now, the way you proceed is the following. You're gonna think of this AK, this is the solution basically, except for this normalization of your equation as sum of terms with uh, um, different powers of epsilon in front. Epsilon is the parameter is in front of the nonlinearity. Okay, so this is infinite sum. And then you plug inside the, um, uh, the AK inside the original equation. Now you see in the world of the Fourier transform, that's what it comes to be. So this is again the equation, but written in Fourier form. So this corresponds to the um, three derivative and then um, oh, the three derivative, which is the Laplace and then derivative in one direction. This is the nonlinearity and, uh, and so on. So you see here, you don't see the K because I have no normal. Anyway, so we move on, and now we have to find all these coefficients. So we have to find the first one, AK0, AK1, AK2. In principle, you should find them all. But if you read the book, you say, well, let's stop just at epsilon square. We're not going to keep anything else which is smaller than epsilon square. Then you plug it in, and what you start obtaining is what well, uh, kind of predictable. The first term is just going to be the initial data. The second term in your expansion, this is the one connected with the epsilon to the power one, you plug it in and you get this expression. Don't worry about what V is, it's just a, a explicit function on the frequency here. And, uh, um, and you reduce everything to the initial data. So these are everything because you see zero here just means initial data and you're using the Duhamel expansion. So you start seeing this integral and my notation is that omega K one two 
it's really omega K1 plus omega K2 minus omega K. And there are integrals. So this is the first expansion of Duhamel, if you want. And I would like to record this by using the first simplest possible example of Feynman diagrams. In other words, the frequency in K is going to be split into two or you know, um, expanded into two, K1 and K2, which represent these two gaps. Finally, zero one is just the initial data. Won't be there at phase. Uh, what the, the no no the initial data also has phase. This one is not with it's not the a it's not the amplitude. It's just the solution. So it has both amplitude and phase. I didn't split it yet. I just meant that the, the zero one is not equal to the shouldn't be equal to the initial data. There is an extra exponential phase and dependent. Let's see. If you solve the first equation of four. Are you meaning this guy? Yeah. There should be one of those. Um, exponential of that times two. That um, it might be that has been uh, maybe oh yeah. So I think uh, it could be that after you do this, you also do a one more gauge transformation and you get to that. So I think you you do that first. Thank you. No, that's correct. You should do that kind of gauge transformation too. So let's yeah. Thank you. Though. That's correct. A module that. That's a, Anyway, so we move on. We have the second one, which is this guy, and you, you know, you just put it in. But the reason why uh, I wanted to write it down is because now I wanted to show the next um, graph or, or uh, um, Feynman diagrams, which is originally we had this, and then you see we split to once more. So now what was the K1 becomes K2 plus K3 and four, and so you see this. So you start seeing these objects that also keep tracks of what you're doing. So this is associated to one integral in time. This one is associated to two integrals times. And um, the point is that uh, in the expansion that you are gonna use, if you wanna keep just the degree epsilon square no more, you will be fine stopping here. Then what you go back and doing is exactly computing the uh, expectation. You write things here. You use that it's a um, random phase and amplitude. So a bunch of things are independent and canceled and you keep only up to epsilon square. And you see it explicitly where it is, everything right here. And then you take your limit and here it pops the equation. Now you can imagine that the, what we did here, um, we have ignored a bunch of things. So for example, we, you only see these two diagrams here. But if you want to make this argument rigorous, you're going to have to say, well, you have to expand in all possible ways. And, and so you see quite a lot of these uh, um, graphs, and there is a lot of uh, combinatorial things that you have to uh, implement if you want to do rigorously. But I just wanted to show you, basically, this is what is done in the, um, in the book on other end. OK, so a little bit of history in making what I just did very, um, you know, in a very simple manner, so to speak, um, what has been done to do to make that rigorous. I would like to go back to the original work of Erdos Yao and Erdos Salmofer and Yao. So they considered the linear Schrodinger. So that's the dispersive equation is a linear Schrodinger, but of course it's a potential on one scale. There is a potential there, and in particular, they also looked at the lattice setting. What do we mean with that? Well, the equation is written in a discrete way, in a discrete manner. So you are mm, working on the lattice. So the derivatives becomes finite differences, and that, if you want to keep in mind what that is. And then they, they, they do um, this limit process that uh, um, I just uh, explained before in the rigorous way. So they have all these Feynman diagrams that they have to um, understand. And they obtain um, the linear Boltzmann at the kinetic time, so that's epsilon minus two. And then going forward, and actually very difficult to go beyond epsilon minus two. They did uh, just put minus epsilon, sorry, like sigma, like a little bit beyond, that's what I mean. The heat equation, so that's, a, if you read the notes of uh, which are really interesting notes by Erdos and how do we see the fusion, that's, um, it's very uh, interesting to see because you explains a lot of the stuff that goes on in how you use, for example, the Feynman diagrams to do the, you know, those integrals in times that I mentioned before. Yes, it is. I mean, it's a bit related to the previous slide, actually. But so the role of the parameter, which is the size of the box, mm -hmm. where do you see this in this form of expansion? 
Because yeah, yeah, you see, yeah, I didn't do all the numbers, but uh, at some point you're going to have to normalize um, in uh, right and left. And so, for example, when I wrote this, yes, in here and this kind of things, you can see um, if you, um, okay, what can I say? How can I say this? So I didn't write it here, but you will, if you read correctly the Nazarenko thing, you will see the L appearing. So it's appearing in the formulas for this. Just on here, yes, just mm -hmm. on this kind of stuff, yes. not on the final equation. Mm -hmm. The spectrum of the Laplacian depends on the size of the. That's Laplacian. correct. That's also and true. The spectrum of the Laplacian the omega. appears mm -hmm. in these coefficients omega, mm -hmm. and so then your resonance conditions will mm -hmm. depend on the. On that. Exactly. So then you have to normalize the things, but uh, it, it shows up in there. You're correct. It appears in there. Okay. All right. So that's, that's the linear case. Then the Lucarin has spawn considered a random cubic NLS. So this was the first time that a nonlinear uh, problem was considered, but at equilibrium. So in other words, the kind of probability measure that the, they are working on is the Gibbs measure, which is invariant. So it's independent of time. And they also are in the, this discrete setting, the Lagos setting. So then much more recently, um, I would like to start with the work of Buckmaster, Germain, Hane, and Chata. Um, they considered the NLS, cubic NLS, um, not in the lattice, but the continuum situation. And then um, in, that, in the first paper, um, they didn't reach the kinetic time. They were be before the absolute minus two, if you want. And then also Colo and Germain and Daniel Germain and uh, sorry, Dan Genani. And they got a little bit closer, actually, an absolute way, a little bit away, um, before the kinetic time. And then Dan Genani um, at the kinetic time for the Schrodinger equation, uh, they obtain rigorously the uh, derivation of the wave kinetic equation. And I just want to mention that also other people are working on this, Lucarin and his student, and in particular, a student here at the Princeton Ma, he's a student of UNESCO, and they co he considered the ZK equation, same equation that I just wrote on the previous um, uh, slides. And uh, mm, you will see, because the rest of the talk is about this equation, you will see that uh, unfortunately it behaves much worse than the NLS because the dispersive function is really singular. And you have to do something. As you will see in the next slides, what Bin and I did was to add the stochastic term in the equation. What they did, what, sorry, what Matt did was to add the dissipation. So there is some dissipation on the equation. Um, I mean, the dissipation unfortunately changed the energy, so it is not any more conserved, but uh, um, that helped him in a, um, overcoming some of the obstacles that I will mention in a moment. And uh, um, he obtained a rigorous derivation, but before the kinetic time. Okay. All right, so now about the result that uh, uh, Bin and I did. So you see, this is strangely written compared to before because you don't see DDT here, but uh, I missed it. It's supposed to be at, uh, no, here we go, DW, okay. So because there is a stochastic term, so this is written as a stochastic equation. Everything up to this point is the same as what I said before with the epsilon for the weak nonlinearity. And then there is this piece, which is a stochastic term, it's noise which also has an epsilon uh, in front. So this is gonna go to zero if the epsilon goes to zero. And theta is, uh, um, will be determined in the proof, but it's a number which is smaller than one. And uh, why do we look at these equations? Well, the two reasons. We looked at this equation not at NLS because um, there had been some recent result of AU that was, which I mentioned in a moment, that was very helpful for us in uh, considering this equation. And uh, why did we put ourselves in the discrete, in the lattice instead of the continuum? Well, because that's, we were looking at the work of uh, Lucarin and Spawn and uh, they had the lattice, although they, they were looking at the sugar instead of the ZK. And unfortunately, it turned out that these were two bad choices because this equation is much more similar than the NLS, so it makes, everything more complicated. And being on the lattice is much more complicated as well. So now in retrospect, we wished we had, you know, we had knew about, knew about this. 
Anyway, so um, passing to the Fourier space, um, going from the lattice into its dual, you end up in this. And again, now, um, like I mentioned already at the beginning, the size of the lattice is D for me here. And what is the dispersion relation? Well, this is the problem. It's uh, uh, when you are in the lattice, you start seeing sine and cosine. So what was before the first coefficient of k becomes sine of k, one, and then this corresponds to the Laplacian. And yes, question? I can answer it. Yeah. On the previous slide, uh, can you comment on the stochastic uh, forcing y of that form? Yes. Y yes. To the theta? Right. So um, let me just one second here. Here. Um, so the reason why, one thing that I want to say is why in that form? Because when you take Fourier transfer, so that becomes um, uh, the um, Statanovic um, type product. So that was because we look at the Fourier transfer, that we put it that way. So now why this coefficient theta here? Yeah, so why there is epsilon or why is to the theta? Both. You're making it, by taking theta less than one, you're making it pretty strong. Yes, exactly, and uh, correct. And that's what we need to offset. And this is gonna be what I'm gonna say to offset the, how bad the dispersion relation is here. So the, the reason why this is bad is because if you think, just don't worry about the sign, just think about k1 times absolute value of k squared. So that's going to be zero in the whole hyperplane. And there has been, uh, and I will mention in a moment, unfortunately, that's going to be really bad when you have oscillatory integral type of estimates. And to offset that, uh, we, we need the noise and we need it strong enough. Anyway, just in terms of what it is, that that's not, um, it's not, it's um, a pretty simple thing, the, the, the stochastic term. So sequence of independent real uh, you know, processes, so nothing really fancy about that, but the, you're right, it's a... Uh... Okay, so once you, we go, just like for the derivation, we go, we normalize, we go back to the um, Fourier transfer, it looks like this. So this part looks like what I wrote before, except that we have now the, the noise here. What we are trying to uh, understand is what we call the two points correlation function, which is nothing else than really the expectation in terms of a particular density function, density um, function row of the Fourier coefficient square. So this is nothing else than the Fourier coefficient. Okay, now let me just state the theorem. Uh, to start, and then we're going to start looking at uh, the difficulties and what is used and so on. So the theorem is exactly what you expect that one should prove. So we are in dimension d greater or equal to two. Uh, by the way, this I should announce now, the input as are marked, but if you are in higher dimension, that power theta can be lower. Okay, so if we want to reach up to this dimension, then the power theta will be bigger. Okay, so um, so the assumption in the or in the so I'm gonna state this in terms of the density function rho. So the assumption for rho is pretty general mom, bound moments, um, and then what we want to prove is that at the kinetic time, so you see again epsilon minus two, this toy, the tau is just a constant, small constant. You have the right thing. So the limit as d goes to infinity and epsilon to zero of this f rescaled in the right way gives us f infinity, which satisfies the three-way equation. Now, to remark that I put here a question, or not question mark, but a, a quotation mark. And that's because this kind of limit is not very strong and uh, um, it will not fit in a page in the way, what kind of limit we're actually taking. So um, I just write it this way, but the, the details are more uh, complex than what I just wrote here. Okay, now um, let's talk for a second more. I already mentioned before that there are issues with the dispersion relation, which in our situation looks like this. And as I mentioned, when we are at zero, um, sorry, we are looking where omega becomes zero, which is a problem when you start developing those integral times that you saw in the uh, formal derivation and start doing integration by parts. Well, the, those, uh, um, when this omega is zero, you have a huge problem. And this omega zero happens too often. In fact, it's at least in the whole, uh, in the upper plane. And in a sense, lots of interaction of frequencies are gonna be trapped on this hyperplane. 
and that hands if you don't have a way of basically kicking this frequency out from the hyperplane, it just it's it, you don't see the wave kinetic equation appearing. At least it's not easy to to deduce it. This is different than when you take the omega k for the, the Schrodinger equation, which is just the absolute value of k squared, which is zero only at one point. So the noise uh, we add in the equation, um, it's, uh, it's, it's strong, as uh, Igor pointed out, but at least preserves the energy. As you will see in a moment, really acts only in the angles does not act on the magnitude and the wave kinetic equation is on the magnitude. And of course, vanishes as epsilon goes to zero, okay? And it's put in, just as I mentioned, to kick the frequency away from this trapping manifold. Um, now, one thing which is different than other kind of derivations is that instead of concentrating on the equation itself and the property of the solution, if you want, we're gonna look at the property of the, um, the, the density function rho, okay? So we're gonna try to get some information from this density function. In for just as a reference, in the case of Lucarina spawn, since they are at equilibrium, this is not changing. But in our case, obviously, it changes, so it satisfies a certain equation. We want to understand some property out of it. Okay, so um, you, it's, this is a probability thing. So you start writing your, uh, um, uh, this is the Fourier coefficient of the solution as a real part, an imaginary part. You start looking at what that uh, uh, satisfy. You write your equation in terms of the pieces of the Hamiltonian, the kinetic and the potential part. And uh, um, we deduce from uh, the equation that we have, what is the equation that the evolutionary role satisfies? And here it is. So this is called, well, we call it a UVL equation, but uh, you can also, some people call it a Fokker-Planck equation. But the one important thing that I wanna remark is the following. So you see this is a square here. So this, I'm gonna change the variable very quickly. I'm gonna use polar coordinates for rho, so you will see that more explicitly. But this is taking the square of this operator. So, and it's on the right side. So it's gonna be smoothing things out. Um, in for us. And these other guys are here just independently on the noise. So as I mentioned, this uh, the idea of looking at the evolution of the density function was, and I had to say, was inspired by the work of Fahou, which had obtained some nice um, uh, properties for that. So let me change variable. Now, my, um, my, uh, um, uh, um, the Fourier coefficient is going to be written in terms of uh, uh, amplitude and um, frequency here. Okay, so now when you write it down, the rho, which depends, of course, on the Fourier coefficient, is going to now depend on this variable C1k, which is from the amplitude, and C2k, which is from the, from the angle, from amplitude and angle. And you rewrite everything, and now it's more explicit here, you see that the with respect to the uh, angle variable, you have um, uh, uh, smoothness, right? Because you have the operator acting um, at the second order. And this is very important and uh, it does improve quite a lot the, um, the estimate that we have to do later. And um, we have to study this equation as well, but I'm not gonna say much more than that, except that uh, the noise, it's only acting really, or it's only smoothing out the angles and not the amplitude. Okay, so now what is the ingredient of the proofs? I already mentioned, and I started with that, the properties of the new real equation. Then the real equation will give us some uh, a priori bounds that control the, the dynamics of the, um, of the equation in the right interval time, which is the kinetic interval. Then the dual expansion and final diagrams and, and the graphs. So I gave you the very simple example in the formal derivation there are just the two very simple graphs. But as you can imagine, if you have all of the, um, if you have to go and estimate all the orders of the epsilon, you becomes very complicated. Now we studied the graphs, the, the, the graphs that we obtain, and uh, um, you have to keep in mind that while you do that, you have, you have quite a lot of singularity coming from the omega k, as explained, and the noise is what makes it um, work. 
the in this forest of uh, graphs that you have, you have to recognize the leading graphs. Those are the ones that like in the um, uh, formal derivation will give you the Q, the, the operator Q, the col collision operator, from the ones that are no leading graphs and you want to tend to zero, you want to make it go to zero. Now here, talk about crossing estimates by using a words coming on the work of uh, Lucarin and Spohn, but uh, um, let's just think about estimate, don't worry about too much about that. And if, but in doing those estimates, there is a, a counterexample of Lucarin, which is exactly the one um, for the type of omega that we have in this, in this system. And I will talk about that in a moment. And finally, what is the resonant broadening um, to finish up? So um, by using the equation from the density function rho, we get some good bounds uh, in times. And I want to mention that uh, in the work of Lucarin and Spohn, this was not the approach. So they didn't use the function rho. So they had to assume some uh, uh, a priori bounds. So these they called L1 clustering estimates. So they were assumptions that were not coming from the equation itself. And in fact, those assumptions were actually proved later, but only in very specific situations. So in our case instead, um, since we work with rho, these estimates are not assumptions, but actually derived from uh, the UV equations itself. Now, next topic that I mentioned in the list was the final diagrams. And you recognize these guys from the formal derivation that I gave before. And this is all you see in the formal derivation because you ignore everything else beyond epsilon square. But of course, in the derivation, uh, the rigorous derivation, you have to treat all of them. So you can imagine that there is just a large number of these diagrams and you have to sort them in different ways and uh, um, just, so how do we do that? How do we sort this? Well, in the dual expansion that I show you in the formal derivation, we stopped after just two steps. Instead in here, when you have to do the whole um, analysis, well, you give yourself um, a certain number M here on which level you stop. And uh, um, that M as epsilon goes to infinity is gonna, uh, sorry, epsilon goes to zero goes to infinity. So it's gonna, it's gonna be a reminder that you have to control, which is really complicated. So, so how, does that, uh, how does that go to infinity as, as epsilon? How, how do you choose that? Yes, so that one, so the-, the um, M E, yeah. Right, so way. as you, in a sense that as you, like we stopped in two epsilon square, you have only two of them. You, you, if you keep going that expansion and you keep going- well, I mean, is it like epsilon, epsilon to the minus two, log epsilon? Right, right. Like, so, log, yeah, epsilon? log epsilon, log exactly. exactly. Okay, so, um, so then you, um, uh, you wanted to estimate that you have to separate the, your graphs from the ones that will give you the equation. Okay, that's the equation that you want. And then the remaining ones are gonna get estimates of this type, epsilon to some theta, and then some function of this m epsilon. So you have to, you, there's gonna be a competition between these two, and you have to make sure that uh, for the pieces that do not are not present in the equation, that goes to zero. So you, you in your analysis, you get this, uh, uh, what we call leading graphs, and that gives the equation, but even this one is gonna have issues as I will mention in a moment. And then the non-leading graphs are the ones that you wanna to send to zero. So the leading graph, we call them the ladder graphs. So you see, this is a similar to the ones that uh, I show you in the uh, formal derivation, just the first one. They're very, uh, they're nested in this nice way. The other ones are way more complex. Okay, now let's think for a second about the um, non-leading graphs. And you, um, when you follow your graphs that you're looking and you start integrating on them, then you have to deal with the situation when the omega is gonna be zero and that's gonna happen in an hyperplane. And in there, you use the noise in uh, when, the, um, when the, the omega is singular. So just as a name, the, time, the place where the omega is singular, we call it Gauss manifold. 
It's not only that thing, because there are other points that you have to avoid when you do your uh, uh, dispersive estimates, but let's just think about the other thing to, to make it easier. So in the ones where um, you really are on the ghost manifold, so when omega is zero, there is no way of doing your oscillatory integrals, because there's just nothing that you can use, and hence the noise is what works and what helps. And when you are outside that ghost manifold, then you can do your oscillatory integral estimates and you can um, get powers of, uh, um, of epsilon and uh, move on with that. Now, what are the extra bad news? So um, let me just make a list first and then I'm gonna go through each one of them with more details. The bad news that uh, um, certainly comes, to, comes up immediately is uh, the fact that uh, um, the contraexample of Lucarinen is exactly uh, for the type of omega that uh, um, are singular, like in our case. So what do I mean with contraexample? Well, he, uh, in their work, they have to do a bunch of uh, integral, um, uh, to estimate a bunch of integrals and uh, uh, with omega, and they prove that those estimates cannot happen when omega um, uh, is zero on an plane. And I will mention that in the next slide. The second bad news is about the bilinear linearity. Well, you might think that having a bilinear linearity is better than having a trilinear linearity. In fact, that's not true in this case. Um, and then the third bad news is that when you take the limits on the leading graphs, so, um, when you take the limit as L, or in this case, D goes to infinity or epsilon goes to zero, and you want to make sense of certain measure, that also has an issue because, again, the singularity. <coughs> so let's uh, um, go uh, uh, item by item. So in his paper, Lucarino writes that uh, an analytic dispersion relation omega k suppresses crossing. Now, suppresses crossing means that you have a good estimate. That's one way uh, of translating in a, in a simple way. If and only if it is not a constant on any affine other plane. And uh, the if and only if says that it also shows a counterexample. And a counterexample is exactly the type of ZK equation that we have here. So that means that uh, uh, you have to work a lot harder and in particular, not unexpected, the results or the limits that you get are gonna be weaker. At the end, everything boils down that you've got to do some kind of integration by parts, and if it's zero too many times, you know, no, it won't work. But does this lead to correction terms in physics uh, or not? Um, so, this in here, you um, correction term is in the So, here we uh, are. You indicated this derivation from right. uh, at the beginning, which just took into account certain terms. You would have to take them all. Right. And we take them all. Does it mean that, that uh, approximation is naive or wrong? Or what? No, it means so in our case, um, so one way for us to get the approximation, to get to the equation, we put some noise which, as I mentioned, it, it, it will create some kind of more oscillation. And that's how we do the limit. Without that, we don't know how to do it. And even with that, the kind of limit is weaker. It's in a weaker norm. They do, yeah. But is it, it's a weaker norm. is it conceivable that the illusion is simply wrong? Yes. That's, that's my question. It's conceivable. Uh, these flat things, they, yeah. Yeah, they, 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 do, they do change. Yeah, you, they do change. change. Absolutely. I totally agree that if we remove completely the noise of something, it might be that that's not the right equation. You have to do something else and I correct. So this is the, I mean, this is actually usefulness, I believe, of doing the regular. That's the way you get them interested, by the way. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah. So for this particular equation, there is that issue, yeah. Okay, so um, bad news too. This is about the fact that we have bilinear non linearity. So if you do the same kind of thing for an LS, cubic NLS, you end up with some L3 norm, which is decaying in time. But if you do the same kind of thing for the ZK equation, you end up with an L2 norm, which is that conserved. So it's not gonna give you decay. So you have to do 
Other things, in particular, approach again in a weaker way, um, don't expect to obtain the same kind of strong type of results. So we have to work hard in order to overcome this issue as well. And um, the final one, now the convergence of the leading graphs. So if you remember in the, in the, in the simple derivation that I put, there were two, I, just stopping at the second level, there was uh, uh, integrals of exponential and then uh, sums of omega and so on. So those things will appear in the, in the leading graph. So you have to take the limit there of those guys. So um, you will see that uh, um, different than the Schrodinger equation and also because we are in the lab, that makes more, more, uh, um, more um, complicated thing. The leading graphs also taking the limit there, which is the one that's supposed to give you the equation is complicated and you have to adjust things. So let me explain a little bit better. What do we mean? So let me just give you this identity here. So in general, you might think that if you take a function f, which is uh, just a test function smooth enough, you get this identity. So you are, you are transforming or you identify somehow this measure delta. So the omega is the, in our case, uh, the Schrodinger is k square and the KDD is the first component k square and so on. So this is the dispersive uh, relation here. So this identity might be true. So, um, but if omega is not smooth enough, this is not a true identity. So if omega is more singular, you cannot have this identity here. So what do we do in order to improve that? Okay, there are different ways that one can do it, but one way of uh, approaching the problem, which physicists do all the time, is use the so-called resonance broadening. So what does that mean? Well, we are gonna use or define our delta L of these omegas is one or two L. Uh, this so we are, we are um, adding this extra integral with this extra piece here, and with that you can um, actually take the limits and so on. So we even have to uh, do this broadening, and this you don't need much. Just you need L strictly greater than zero to make sense. And of course, in the, also in the formal derivation, this was not something that was considered, just the, the delta that will appear, the delta or the various omega that appear in the um, uh, collision operator would just, you know, put it there. So um, I think I'm going to summarize just the, uh, what is that we are thinking about from this point on. One thing that we are thinking about, which I didn't write here, that we wished we had not used that equation. So that was just the, the, just a lot of complications. And certainly for some people that were trying to do this for the first time, it was not really a good equation to use, but uh, there we are. Um, now, seriously though, what are we thinking? One thing to, um, to maybe ponder about is the connection between what I talked about yesterday, that was the energy cascade, which is completely deterministic and is for long times. Um, compared to the wave kinetic equation, which is derived for the kinetic time and, uh, and so on. So how are those two things related though? Is there a relationship? So also what happens after time epsilon to the minus two? Um, mathematically speaking, it's, a, it's a, um, a different order of magnitude of complexity because the way the graphs appear and the combinatorial stuff and, uh, and, and the complexity coming from all the lists that are made of the bad things that- uh, Basically, you're just doing very high order perturbation theory, right? Yeah. And then trying to keep track of everything. Yeah, and then the keeping track of everything. Track of everything. And then keep, track, exactly they, the problem. They keep track of remainders. That's the, last uh, that's the hardest part. And so far, we do not have enough decaying coming, you know, or at least enough powers of epsilon to offsets all the rest of, um, yeah. There is also big combinatorial type of problems in there. So if one can get hold of that and understand that better, maybe there is a way of, there are constellations that we don't see, I mean, all of that stuff. So we don't know, there is no, you know, like I said, the only result that we are um, aware of is for the linear with potential. Yeah. 
Um, there is also uh, a quantistic way of kinetic equations. Um, and so this is more related to what I have, just what I mentioned, uh, Gross, Petavieski, hierarchy, and so on before. But uh, uh, recently with my postdoc, at least we proved that the uh, formal kinetic equation that comes for that, it's well posed, so there's that, but there is no derivation for it. Um, of course, wave kinetic equation for other kind of dispersive systems, and I will advise anybody who tries to pick something that has a relatively nice omega, otherwise uh, you end up having a lot of problems. On the other hand, it's interesting to use something which is not easy because it might not be true. Uh, equation that, uh, that I used to think it should happen. And then also there is the homogeneous three-wave kinetic equation. There's some recent work that we did. And um, yeah, so I'm gonna stop here. Thank you so much. Any questions? If you, if you had added uh, noise to the mm. uh, original NLS mm. system, mm -mm. life would have been much easier? I'm not sure it would be much easier. I, I think you still have to go through the whole. Still have all this. Yes. But you get you get beyond the you get a little bit beyond the, the time scale that, that people got before, right? I'm not sure if you can go beyond the epsilon to the minus two. But what you can probably do is that in here there is usually a relation. I mean, the way one can do this is with a relationship between epsilon and L when you take the limits. That can be improved. For sure. But going beyond the time, uh, epsilon minus two, I think it's in more, more. Well, I have to say, it, you might be able to cook up a noise which is strong enough that does a lot of things. I don't, I don't, that's, cheating. <laughs> that's cheating, right? Yeah, so yeah, you yeah. want to do something that doesn't act on yeah, the amplitude. Well, noise would be fine. Yes. Yeah. But you still have the same problems. I think you have the same problem. It just makes them easier. I uh, mean, yeah, that's my impression. But Igor had a. Well, I was going to say that even in this case, you pointed out that, of course, the, the, the limit noise does not influence the resulting yes. limit for the amplitude. Yes. But if you want to look at the uh, two point correlation function, yes. That would be different than in the case if you did not put that stochastic force into it. Right? So, and I was going to ask is there a prediction of what the, the correlation function? Which equation uh, do you have a limit for the correlation? Uh, maybe Nazarenko has in this book. He has he considered different. Uh, the, in fact, this uh, situation is a subcase of uh, what is the right. So if you go there, I think you you can see it. And um, technically speaking, why why did you take the lattice? Yeah. Like it would have been easier. I know. It's the, yes, I totally agree. But we were looking at the, we had in our mind the work on looking at spawn, and they were they took the lattice, and that's what we were carrying away. So, so the lattice is giving you trouble. It's more trouble. Yes. It's this non smoothness of the uh, of the dispersive. It's more. Uh, it's yeah, it's more intense. Yes. So it's yeah. uh it's, it complicates things. Yes. So does a does a random phase approximation play any role? In, in, I mean, the physicists use it all the time. Yes. They imagine that as time goes on, the, the phases are pretty much yeah. correlated. That's you can and that, and that maybe persists for very long time scales. We don't know, but uh, but but do you use that? I mean, uh, are you de implicitly deriving that? We are working with. Uh, um, so in this work, in our work, so we are just reading everything out of the raw. And really, the the, the density function yeah. and the a priori and the fact that you get some good a priori bounds in the moments, that's what we're using in, in here. Yeah, and after that, it's kind of more like a deterministic. You know, you do yeah. oscillatory integrals and yeah. You know this this work of Yao and Yin and Yang. They go below beyond the time scale they prefer a slightly different model. They go yes, very much further. And what do they get? The equation. They get three equations. Exactly. That's what. But here I don't. I don't know.
So for example, uh, people are trying to get the wave kinetic equation for the water wave problem, which is, but some people say that uh, they, there is, it's, I don't know if it, uh, I was talking to Josh at uh, they, it's not what they expect. Okay, maybe that's the way to put it. So it's, uh, there are a lot of things that uh, if, when you start going deeper into the relation that I know what you expect. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you.